I'm so very excited to have our uh, distinguished uh, uh, guest speaker, uh, Mr. William Pesek, uh, who is widely known as the world's leading uh, journalist and, and writer uh, in the field of uh, uh, geopolitics, social issues, economics, finance, you name it. Very broad areas that are uh, of our uh, big interest. And today's topic cannot be more or timely, as you would agree, uh, because uh, exactly two months away, uh, we have uh, US uh, presidential election, which would uh, have a profound impact on a uh, wide range of issues that we face uh, today. Uh, security, uh, diplomacy, uh, economics, trade, finance, investment, all other uh, areas are very much contingent upon the outcome of our uh, election. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it's considered a, a race that is too close to call at this point. Uh, but uh, with the help of Mr. Pesek, uh, we would have a better view about what's really happening uh, uh, over the next uh, two months. Now, I would like to uh, uh, introduce our speaker as usual, uh, but I will try to minimize his very long uh, bio, uh, uh, given the time constraint. Uh, Mr. Pesek is a long-time Asia uh, opinion writer uh, based in Tokyo. Uh, actually, uh, his lovely wife is uh, Japanese, so no wonder he's been uh, there for 20 years. Uh, 20 years in the region, mostly with uh, Bloomberg and Barons on Asian economics, politics, business, and social trends. He is uh, uh, also author of a best-selling book uh, entitled uh, Japanization. Uh, that was published in 2014. Uh, the, the subtitle was What the World Can Learn from Japan's Lost Decades. It's a widely read uh, book. Uh, Mr. Pesek uh, has been writing uh, for uh, Nikkei Asian Review, Forbes, Barron's, uh, South China Morning Post of the Hong Kong, uh, State Straight Times of Singapore, uh, as I understand, Australia, Financial Review, uh, you name it, so many others. And, and also Euro Money and Asia Money magazines, uh, and occasionally for the, for the Washington Post and Politico. He's also a regular speaker on BBC, uh, British BBC and CNBC, among many others. Prior to Asia, he spent five years in Washington, D.C., covering the Fed, Federal Reserve, and the U.S. Treasury for uh, Barons and uh, Dow Jones. Before that, in New York, his hometown, actually, uh, New York, as a Dow Jones reporter, uh, where he uh, covered the credit market columns for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, he received so many honors and awards. Uh, which I would like to skip. So, well, let's welcome uh, Mr. Pesek uh, for his speech. Uh, Good morning. Thank you for that very, very kind introduction. Um, it's always a pleasure to be in Seoul. This is actually my first time here since before COVID, unfortunately. So it's really wonderful to have an opportunity to walk the streets as I did last night and get together with old sources. And it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, yes, these are very interesting times. And I happen to be in the US in June and parts of July. My, my mother and father, they live in New York and Queens. And I was, uh, they're getting older. And I was there helping out with the family. So I happen to be there during a very tumultuous time in recent US history. I was there uh, the night when Donald Trump and Joe Biden had their shocking debate. Um, I was still in the US when Donald Trump uh, w was shot in the ear. So it was a very, very interesting moment to be 7,000 miles away from my current home in Tokyo, back in my, uh, my hometown. And on June 27th, 
I happened to be with my brother and his wife and his, their children. We were in Florida, actually. Um, we just happened to be down there for a couple of days. They have family down there. And during the month of June every year, my brother and I, we do a dry month, no alcohol, which is always very challenging, but we do it every year, every June. So we're watching the Trump-Biden debate that night, and suddenly we see that Joe Biden is having some issues, and we're suddenly very worried because we are a family of Democrats, I guess. And um, we did what any adult would have done. We said, uh, where's the booze? So we opened up some beer, some wine, some whiskey. So we blew our, our dry month three days away from the end of the month. That's how stressful we were watching Joe Biden having a difficult night. But you fast forward to where we are today, and things are very, very different. Um, now, I have some slides here. OK, so my first slide, I have a, a list of names here. Adam Smith, John Menard Keynes, David Ricardo, Friedrich Hayek, Joseph Schumpeter, and Karl Marx. Um, what do these people have in common? Uh, one is they're all white men that we studied in college. The second thing is they're all dead. And the third thing is I feel bad for them, not because they're dead, but because many of the economic theories that they offered are looking less and less relevant in today's world. Um, if you think about just the last 10 years, um, they've missed out on the rise of China and the way that China is remaking the global economy. They've missed out on the rise of East Asia, the rise of South Asia, the rise of Southeast Asia, Brexit, the COVID pandemic, and of course, Trump. So the world is very different from the world that these gentlemen had examined. Um, and now, my next slide, of course, is if, if uh, Kamala Harris wins. And now, no one knows what to expect. In 2016, just before the, uh, the, the Trump-Hillary Clinton election, I was in Singapore giving a speech about how there's no way Trump can win. Don't worry about it. Trump is not going to win. And I laid out my entire argument. And about two weeks later, the organizer of the event emailed me and said, what happened? You were so wrong. I said, so no one knows what to expect. Um, but I will say I'm sleeping a bit easier at the moment, given the way that the election has shaked out. Before Donald Trump became president, my hair was dark brown. And so it's getting whiter and whiter. Even my eyebrows are getting a bit white, so I, I blame him for that. But again, my. My base case scenario is I think that Kamala Harris will defeat Trump. I think it will be a very close election. And if Harris becomes the next president of the United States, I expect a lot of continuity. Um, I know that there's a lot of speculation in the US about how she's more liberal than Joe Biden, and that might be true in certain ways. But I see a lot of continuity with regard to um, what we call, sorry, I've. Uh, I managed to knock the, uh, the PowerPoint out here. I expect a lot of continuity with regard to the policies that you've seen. With. So I see a lot of continuity with regard to what we've seen from the Biden administration. Um, you know, I think that Joe Biden um, has actually had a, a quite successful presidency if you look at the cards that he was dealt, if you look at the extent to which the US economy was literally falling off a cliff on fire when he took over. Um, he had to kind of pull the economy back up, put out the fire, um, begin rebuilding. And I think that arguably he's done a quite decent job with that. Um, and I think that one of the things we'll see with, with a Biden administration, or rather a Harris administration, would be a continuation of those policies. Um, I think here in Asia, I think that you would see an effort to mend, uh, mend fences, if you will. I think that you know Joe Biden, he spent a lot of time in Washington, not as much time traveling as many of his predecessors did. One reason is the level of crises that he was dealing with. I think that the Harris administration would be a lot more outward facing, if you will. And I think that you would see a lot more efforts from the Harris administration to improve relations with Asia. Um, I think. One way in which I think the Biden administration 
has been quite successful is building economic muscle at home. I think that the Biden administration is focused very much on, in many ways, America's economic software, not just the hardware. You've seen investments in chips. You've seen investments in green energy. Um, for the first time in many years, the US has, I would argue, been investing in building better economic muscle, not just necessarily slapping tariffs on countries like China uh, to weigh down China. The US, I think, has been looking to or trying to compete uh, in a more active way. And I think you'll see more of that under Kamala Harris. I just do think that you would see, um, I think that we're living at, again, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we're living in very unprecedented times. But I think that she would seek to work with Japan more closely and with South Korea more closely. I think that one of Biden's real accomplishments has been in many ways getting Prime Minister Kishida of Japan and President Yoon of South Korea in a room together um, more than once to talk about where cooperation can take, can take place between these great economies. And I think that you'd see more of that under Harris. Now, what if the opposite happens and Trump wins? Um, it is possible, I must admit. I, again, I come from Queens, New York, and many of my family members are Trump supporters and Trump voters. So I used to love Christmas. Christmas has now uh, become a, a contentious holiday within my family. But Trump could certainly win this election. The US is a very 50-50 country. And you know, two months in politics can be a very, very long time. We have no idea what to expect. But if Trump gets, uh, gets another chance at the White House, I think you will see an effort to make trade wars great again. Um, I think you'll see him not only going after China, but after Europe. And I know that there's a lot of focus on, say, tax rates in the US, and that's very important. But I do think the extent to which Trump would slap tariffs on Asia um, would be a, a very toxic moment for the global economy. Uh, I think you would see more market chaos. And I think that countries like Japan, countries like South Korea, uh, would have reason to worry. Um, one thing that we've seen Trump talking about, of course, is 60% tariffs on China. I see that as just the beginning. I see that as just the kind of table stakes, if you will. I think you would see a bigger effort to slap tariffs on China. Um, Trump has talked about 100% tariffs on certain automobile imports. Would we see him extending that policy not only past Mexico, but to Asia as well? And that is a moment that I think would have significant fallout for Asian markets. And I think that the other thing that Asia needs to worry about with, with regard to Trump is Trump is very transactional. And there's a reason why you, in, in you know, North Korea, Kim Jong-un, and in China, Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, there's a reason why these leaders are cheering for Trump to come back into the White House. <clears throat> Excuse me. And one of the reasons is not only the chaos that he would bring to Washington, which is good for autocratic countries, because it's not, the, the economic fallout is not necessarily good for them, but the ways in which Trump might drag down the US and its efficiency in the world and its reputation in the world, there's a certain benefit to that. But I think that one of the things you'll see with Trump, perhaps, after he begins to make these trade wars great again, is sitting down with China and trying to come up with some kind of grand bargain, some kind of bilateral trade deal that leaves the rest of the region on the outside looking in, that leaves Japan and South Korea and the Philippines, again, on the outside looking in. And you know, would Taiwan at that point be an interesting bargaining trip, chip, where Trump is concerned? And I think no one really knows what to expect where that is concerned. Trump has also talked a great deal about policies that people at the International Monetary Fund and your former colleagues at the World Bank would find very anathema. Um, one would be perhaps maybe not devaluing the dollar, but favoring a significantly weaker dollar. Um, 
basically stripping the Federal Reserve of some of its autonomy. Project 2025 is something that Americans talk about quite a bit, but one of the core strategies, economic strategies of Project 2025 would be to change the Fed's mandate. And we do know that Donald Trump in the past has threatened to fire the Fed chairman, to browbeat the Federal Reserve into cutting interest rates. He's even mulled the idea of canceling some parts of US debt to make a point with China. And so I just worry about how a Trump 2.0 White House, which is somewhat unhinged, might, uh, might operate. Now, I think there are risks either way, depending on, regardless of who wins, whether it's Kamala Harris or Donald Trump, there are risks either way. If Trump loses, there's no way he's going to go away silently. You will see probably another January 6th type insurrection on Capitol Hill. You already see Trump suggesting that the only way he could lose is if the election is rigged. So I see that as his attempt to begin setting the groundwork for his supporters to not accept the results of the election. And I think we have to remember uh, the last time this happened, the effect on the US credit rating. The one when Fitch ratings stripped away America's AAA rating in 2023, one of their rationales was weakness in US governance, but also the volatility of governance. They, in many ways, they tied their decision to strip the US of a AAA rating in some ways to the events and the political polarization that led to January 6th. The US has one AAA rating left, Moody's Investor Service. Would that be the reason for the moment when Moody's also says no more AAA for the US? That would have catastrophic effects on global markets, given the fact that whether we like it or not, the dollar and the US, US treasuries are very much the linchpin of global finance. Um, I think also, regardless of who wins, the US is not as open to free trade as it once was. And I think we'll be moving more and more in that direction. Um, I think the US has significantly turned inward in recent years. And while I think a Harris administration would be more free, free you know, pro-free pro trade than a Trump administration, I do think the appetite in Washington, the appetite among American voters right now is not in favor of the kinds of free trade we've seen in the past with NAFTA, um, with China's entry into the World Trade Organization. So there's that. And I think regardless of who wins, you will see China tensions. Um, you will see uh, in, in many ways, certainly, as I said, you might see Trump try to do a grand bargain with China. But certainly, the beginnings of Trump 2.0 would be pretty chaotic in terms of US and Chinese cooperation. Um, now, one of the things that I see happening in Asia at the moment and going forward, and this gets us more specifically to talk about the Korean economy, is I think that China has sped up Asia's economic clock. Um, if you think about, you know, in America, we would always say that, uh, you know, basically dogs live seven years for every one year that a human does. And I think we're living in China years, where China is speeding up the economic clock year after year, forcing other economies around the world, but especially here in Asia, to raise their economic games. And I think even though China is having significant problems at the moment, there's a lot of speculation it won't meet 5% growth this year. Um, there's a lot of concerns about the property market. There's a lot of concerns about youth unemployment. Uh, there's a lot of concerns about, you even see increased protest activity happening around China. Despite that, China is still speeding up the economic clock, forcing the region to respond and raise its competitiveness. Um, and you know, with the People's Bank of China, of course, uh, is a great focus of intrigue at the moment. I think many investors, many economists have been very surprised by how tolerant President Xi Jinping and the People's Bank of China have been at this moment when China's growth is slowing. Uh, you've seen a lot less action in terms of rolling out new fiscal stimulus, in terms of the PBOC cutting interest rates. Will we see more of that in the, the last few months of 2024 
and into 2025? I think we will. I think we will see a moment where President Xi Jinping, for better or worse, will put aside his deleveraging priorities and focus more on fiscal and monetary stimulus. And then we get into a situation where, at a moment when the yen is rising, we see the Chinese currency perhaps falling. And the reason I say at the bottom of this slide, escaping 1985, is I often think that one of the things we've seen with Trump in the US and with Abenomics in Japan has been a return to the policies in many ways of 1985. We see leaders have focused more on certainly tariffs, but on trickle-down economics. They've both officials in Tokyo, Abenomics, and officials in Washington, Trumponomics, they've given trickle-down economics another try and proved once again that it doesn't necessarily work. So I think one of the big questions for me going into the year ahead is will Japan, will the US escape the policies of 1985? I hope so. We'll see. Now, you know, I mentioned this time problem with regard to China and the way that China is speeding up the economic clock in Asia. I think one of the things that Korea needs to worry about is the, the extent to which China is changing the events on the ground, if you will, in Asia. And, you know, I, the first time I visited South Korea was in 1997. It was during the Asian financial crisis, and so things have changed um, immeasurably in Korea since then, for the better, of course. But, you know, we've seen this succession of governments, especially since the mid-2000s, who have come and gone with great, great plans, great ambition to remake the economy, to increase uh, the, the, you know, basically the role of small to medium-sized enterprises to level the playing field, to increase the quality of the business environment. And I wonder if Korea at the moment is realizing the extent to which the clock is accelerating around it in the world, but especially with regard to China. And I would like to see more action here on the ground. Every year there's this effort to get M MSCI to upgrade Korea. And it's a very important process, but it comes and goes with a lot of talk and not enough action to see, to see the process through. And so I'm hoping that we will see more of a, an effort for the UN administration to roll up their sleeves and in many ways disrupt the economy in ways uh, that will make uh, Korea more competitive going forward. You know, the, the Bank of Korea, last night when I was walking around the neighborhood, um, I walked past the Bank of Korea. It's always uh, one of my favorite buildings to walk past in Seoul, but you know, it, more to my preference when I get to enter it and interview officials there. You know, the Bank of Korea has played a very interesting role in recent years. It was the first, uh, arguably the first major central bank to raise interest rates after COVID-19. So that put Korea in the global headlines for many of the right reasons. And you see a lot of speculation right now about whether the BOK will be cutting interest rates in the months and weeks ahead. And I see this as, you know, living in Japan, I see this as one of the, the problems at the moment where central banks have come to, in many ways, do the jobs of elected officials and government officials who should be raising the, their economy's economic games. We've seen this kind of abdication of economic policy to central banks. This is not unique to Asia. I was covering the Alan Greenspan uh, Federal Reserve when I was in Washington, D.C. And we saw that in the U.S. as well, where a lot of politicians, they just found it a lot easier to, in many ways, pass their responsibilities over to monetary policy because it was just a lot easier to have the Fed regulate interest rate policy. And I kind of wonder, with regard to Asia, with, if we've reached the limits of, of that setup, if we've reached the limits of the ability of central banks like the Bank of Korea, like the Bank of Japan, 
like the Reserve Bank of India, to steer economic policy without wholesale and top-down changes from government policy. And I think that will be an interesting issue in the year ahead. And also, you know, gender is something I write about quite a bit with regard to Japan, with regard to South Korea. And I would like to see the government here take the issue of gender equality more seriously. All the available evidence, all the available research, whether we're talking about the you know, OECD, whether we're talking about the World Bank, whether we're talking about the Asian Development Bank, whether we're talking about Goldman Sachs, all of the available research suggests that not only companies, but nations, economies that best utilize their female workforces are more innovative, more productive, more competitive. And I know that Korea in recent years has actually done better in this regard than, say, Japan. Um, it, when you look at like the World Economic Forum statistics with regard to this, I think Korea at the moment is doing better than Japan, but it still trails Guatemala and Zambia with regard to gender equality. So that's something I'd love to see the government focus more on. And I just have a couple of more slides. You know, um, shameless pitch for the book you, <laughs> you mentioned earlier. My, the book I wrote about Japan is, is 10 years old at this point, so it's a bit dated, certainly. But I often think about the lessons from Japan's lost decades and how the world needs to learn these lessons. And, you know, when you think about different economies that have similar challenges, to what Japan experienced. South Korea certainly is one. I'm not expecting a lost decade in South Korea. I'm not. But I do think that when we see this revolving door of governments coming and going, saying we're going to change the economic system, we're going to level the playing fields, we're going to make labor markets more dynamic, we're going to provide more oxygen for startups so that they can not only start but grow into medium-sized enterprises and large enterprises and disrupt the economy. Um, I look at, say, China in this regard. I think China is actually a better candidate for a lost decade, uh, a Japan-like lost decade, than South Korea. And I think it's all about Xi Jinping. I think people talk about how Xi Jinping is this incredibly strong leader, the most potent Chinese leader since Mao, and that's certainly true. But if you look at the ways in which China is regressing with regard to policy, when you look at the ways in which China is moving backward with regards to openness, with regards to space for people to argue for different steps forward, I think China is certainly moving in the wrong direction with regard to that. India, in certain ways, I think, could experience, experience a lost decade going forward, partly because we see a lot of top-down talk about change and not enough mechanical, uh, not a lot of microeconomic change below the surface. Um, and I think one of the issues we're seeing, of course, is this foreign exchange addiction. Um, in Japan, we've come to talk about the yen as the Japanese peso or the Japanese rupiah. I recently spent a little time in Europe on vacation in, in Italy and Germany. And um, the Japanese yen does not go very far. Now, the Japanese yen, I know, is rising at the moment. But <clears throat> excuse me, Japan is one of those examples of an economy that has spent way too much time devaluing their currency a as, a, as a crutch, if you will, as an excuse not to change the economy. And when you look at the lessons from Japan in that regard, what we've seen is that this weak yen policy over the last 25 years it's taken the onus, the responsibility off the government to do its job and to level playing field to make Japan more competitive. It's also taken the onus off companies, off corporate CEOs to restructure, to innovate, to shake things up. And I think I'd love to see a move away from this foreign exchange addiction. And my final slide is about market risks. Now, we were just talking at breakfast this morning about the extent to which U.S. stocks had a, what they're calling a mini crash overnight. Um, you know, there are many risks for the year ahead that I think we need to keep an eye on. One is, of course, Chinese deflation. Um, as someone who's been writing about deflation in Japan for some time, it does worry me the extent to which China seems to think that 
it's one economic stimulus package away from defeating deflation. It's not that simple. And the problem with deflation is it has, uh, it has a knack for taking on a life of its own. And I would love to see China doing more to battle deflation. Um, the yen carry trade. Um, I, think, I, I think of the yen carry trade as the, the shark from the movie Jaws, you know, the 1975 Steven Spielberg movie. It basically will come and attack markets, and then it goes underwater for a while, it goes away, and people think the yen carry trade is no longer a risk until, boom, it pops up again and bites you. And so I think the yen carry trade will be with us very much in the months ahead in, in very unpredictable ways. And you know, when it comes to central banks, I often wonder you know, which of the major central banks will be most likely to make a big policy error. Is the Federal Reserve in the US, have they been too slow to cut interest rates? Or is cutting interest rates a mistake in the months ahead with, with inflation still above 2%? It's an open question. The Bank of Japan, is the Bank of Japan overplaying its hand, raising interest rates too quickly? It's an open question. And the People's Bank of China, are they being too patient with regard to deflationary pressures and not cutting interest rates fast enough. And finally, my last point is we're at a moment, as I mentioned these economists at the start of my speech here, we're at a moment where there's no blueprint for where we are, where we're heading. Uh, there's no you know, gray beard, some smart old man or woman to turn to and say, well, in your day, how did policymakers deal with this risk or that risk? We are in totally unprecedented times. And that's very exciting. And of course, there's the old Chinese proverb, you know, may you live in interesting times, but not too interesting. Well, we live in times that maybe are a little too interesting for me. And I hope that the next time I'm here in Seoul, uh, I will have some hair left to, uh, when, I, when I address you. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Pesek, uh, for, for an excellent uh, uh, presentation. Uh, setting the stage for a uh, very active uh, uh, dialogue, uh, Q&A session. I may start, but uh, if you have any, uh, you know, audio, audience, uh, is any uh, question, you're welcome. Uh, Mr. Uh, oh Young-jin, he's the president of uh, Korea Times. Uh, okay, you're welcome to, uh, uh, to raise a question. Yes. Says, yeah, um, microphone. Number one question. It's uh, the what you know the on on what do you base your prediction that Kamala Harris will win on November fifth? Since you're wrong with your prediction for the you know the previous Trump yeah. election. Thanks for That's reminding me. That's number one. Yeah, <laughs> you, you said it. You just, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. And number two. It's a, you know, the, you, you talked about the, you know, the Harris wins, and it will, you know, the uh, represent, you know, the continuity of the status quo. Don't you think that, you know, the world is uh, in such a state that we need some big change? Hmm. It's, a, you know, the, the, to the scale of the, you know, like the, you know, the, uh, what do you call that? After the, you know, World War II. So don't we, you know, it's, it's like, you know, the, the first aid treatment on the, you know, the problems we have across the world, having the, you know, the Harris or somebody like the, you know, the status quo, you know, the president, especially important uh, in important country like the United States. Right. That's num my number two question. Number three, I, I don't know whether you are aware <coughs> of it. The, you know, the, nowadays, uh, one of the biggest, you know, the political issue in this country is about, the, you know, the martial law, potential martial law to be imposed by the, you know, the, you know, the current administration. The, my president didn't go to the you know, opening of the National Assembly, and it was uh, unprecedented. And then it was, uh, you know, some, you know, the, it's not me, somebody, you know, a lot of people point out that he's, uh, you know, the indifference to the, you know, the public opinions. And uh, plus, and there's, uh, you know, other things. It's a uh, little bit uh, of the intricacies I would not give you uh, or make my, you know, the, the question uh, lengthening. But one thing is, uh, do you think it's possible for us to have a, like a 1980-style martial law uh, followed by the, you know, the coup d'etat from the, you know, the, the person outside the, you know, the, this country? 
from the, you know, the, your viewpoint. That's number three questions. I'm done. Okay. Thank you well, uh, for your uh, three, <laughs> three questions, how much time especially the last one. <laughs> Make it how much time do we have? Well, okay. um, well, I mean, you know, y your questions are, are very well taken. Um, maybe my optimism about Harris winning, it, some of it could be wishful thinking, of course, given how wrong uh, I was and a lot of pollsters were about Trump winning in 2016. But I, I think that a couple things are happening. One is that I think you're going to see a lot of quiet Harris voters. And what I mean is in 2016, there was this phenomenon where people would never tell a pollster that they would vote for Trump. They did it anyway, but they claimed that they wouldn't. They were almost, like my father is a perfect example. My father voted for Trump in 2016, um, didn't tell us. Um, he, well, because he, uh, he one confessed. night, <laughs> One night over too many uh, pints of Guinness, he, um, he admitted it. My brother and I were very upset. He, did, he voted, he voted for, for Biden in 2020. But I think what you'll see this time is I think you will see a lot of people who are just exhausted. And I think you'll see a lot of quiet Harris voters. I think you'll see a lot of people voting in a way that it isn't that they like Kamala Harris, that they love Kamala Harris, but they're exhausted. And they want to change. And I think that you'll see a lot of that. I also think that women in the US are deeply turned off by what the Trump administration is offering. And I think women, um, maybe especially women of color, will carry Harris over the, over the finish line. Again, I could, you know, we'll exchange e emails, email uh, cards later, and you can tell me uh, how dumb I am in two months. But um, that's, my, that's my belief. Um, and do we need more? Absolutely. But I see the U.S. as having something of a midlife crisis at the moment. And I see anything that stabilizes the U.S. as a step in the right direction. I do think that you will see the Harris administration doing more in terms of building alliances around the world. And I think when you see the extent to which the BRICS are trying to, say, create a, a currency outside the dollar, uh, some, something of a, of a rival currency to the US dollar. I think that you will see the Harris administration coming up with a different policy mix than you've seen from the Biden administration, partly because I think Biden had to spend so much time literally putting out the fire, ending COVID, in many ways putting out a variety of of forest fires in the U.S., I think Biden will have uh, Harris would have more bandwidth to change things. And I'm not sure I fully followed the, the third part of your question, but maybe we can uh, we can have that conversation later. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Chen. Uh, <laughs> I should. I, I mean, I, 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 sh I, I, I should be asking you that. Um, maybe, maybe over some soju. I, I think that is the answer to the question. <laughs> well, <clears throat> Mr. Pethek, for your interesting talk, I have two questions to be fair to each candidate. Uh, in case you know Harris is going to win these elections, uh, <coughs> in addition to what you said during your talk, there's growing projections based on her party affiliations and where she's coming from, California. She is like to push agenda like environment, climate change very strongly. If she wins, maybe she's going for eight years. So that is implication that she may use trade policy, not free trade, but so-called reciprocal trade policy to push her trade, uh, non-trade agenda like environment. I think there is a huge implication of a country like South right. Korea, Taiwan, and uh, Japan, which is uh, having very you know, heavy industry uh, relations. So is there any discussion in Washington? Uh, I mean, uh, Washington and Tokyo, is the possibility and okay. uh, the, what, what uh, can be done by industry and government? And second question is, in case Trump is coming back, we understand a year ago, Camp David, there are two you know, the leaders are taking pictures. As you see, two will be gone sooner or later. Only Mr. Yoon Sang-yeol will be remaining. And that is, if Trump is going to winning, as you mentioned, he's very transactional, try to go alone with China and other country. That is like to weaken 
uh, Tokyo, Seoul, Washington trilateral, uh, you know, the, uh, the cooperation. And is there any concern from Tokyo from your vintage point? Uh, what, what can be done from those perspectives? Those are my two questions. Thank you. Hmm. No, good questions. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I think there's a, but I think in America right now, there's a very wide gap between what Kamala Harris might want to do and what she'll be able to accomplish with regard to Congress. Yes, absolutely. I, I, she definitely does support tying U.S. trade policy more closely, more intimately with climate change provisions. That's something that's very important to her. But I'm not sure that Congress has the appetite to support her where that's concerned. And I think there's so much talk in the U.S. right now about how many of the policies that Kamala Harris had in 2019 and 2020 seem very different from the person she is today. Now, she will argue that she's been in the Biden administration in the White House for nearly, you know, for more than three and a half years now. So she's learned on the job and she's come to different levels of, of um, understanding about what's possible. But I think the, the biggest issue really is I think she's been in the rooms and she's realized the appetite in Congress for change and more to the point, the appetite in Congress for not moving in that direction and not giving her what she wants with regard to tying climate change policy to trade policy. And so I think her aspirations are one thing, what she can actually accomplish are another. So frankly, <clears throat> excuse me, I would love to see the US more, clo more intimately connect it its trade relations and its trade policies with green, green growth. But I'm not sure that Congress has the, uh, the appetite for it. And the second part of your question was what? I'm sorry? I, Trump, it was tr Trump, right? Um, and w w so what was it again? Your, the, the second part of your question? Oh, sorry, yes. Um, I mean, I, I think that you, one of the issues we're seeing with regard to Japan, for example, is I worry about Japan returning to a kind of revolving door of leaders. You know, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was in power for five years. He was replaced by Prime Minister Suga, who lasted 12 months. And then we saw Prime Minister Kishida, who's been around for almost three years. Kishida now is stepping aside. I think that the next leader you'll see in Japan will also be a short timer, because Japan has a national election in October of 2025. So whatever leader Japan picks uh, in this month's, or rather next month's uh, party election, probably will last 12 months. And I think we're in this cycle where Japan, every 12 months, will be having a new, new, new prime minister. When I, lived, worked, when I worked in Washington, there was this joke uh, among journalists and among the people of the Treasury Department. You know, we could learn the name of Japan's latest prime minister, but what's the point? Because 12 months from now, there's a new guy. <laughs> and I think that Japan is settling back into that cycle. And, you know, where does that leave Tokyo Seoul relations? I think that, you know, China has, and their pol China and its policies, and Trump, um, have so thoroughly concerned officials in, J in Japan and South Korea to the point that they're, they're talking, they're becoming friendly, which is wonderful and fascinating. But I wonder if we will see the continuity in Tokyo you need to maintain those ties. I hope I'm wrong, but I think it's an open question. Yeah. Chairman Song. Yeah. Uh, many of my friends, recent, many of my friends recently traveling to California, especially city of San Francisco, and they lament about the deplorable condition of San Francisco. What do you expect? when Harris is elected, uh, will uh, be San Francisco like five years now? That is question <laughs> one. And can you possibly describe what will look like five years now in, uh, in uh, Northeast Asia, uh, considering the competition between uh, US and China and the economic growth, etc. So that what is your opinion about uh, your your uh, thoughts about five years now, uh, considering 
different factors do you know? Yeah. That is Good. my second question. Yeah, poor, poor San Francisco gets, gets no respect. Um, I, I love San Francisco. It's such a, a vibrant city. I always love going there, but you're right. Um, San Francisco is having a, its own midlife crisis, if you will. The homeless problem in San Francisco is, is, is incredible, and it's depressing. And it's one of the reasons why I think there's been a lot of talk about the governor, Gavin Newsom, uh, being a, a future presidential candidate. One of the big problems he faces is, you know, what about your state? What about San Francisco? And this is something that Kamala Harris will have to explain as well. You know, I think the post-COVID period has made things even worse with regard to homelessness uh, in the U.S. and homelessness in, in San Francisco. And it is a major challenge for San Francisco as much as it is in New York as well. Um, Northeast Asia in five years? It's a great question. I think that, as I just mentioned, you know, we're probably in Japan, we're reverting to this revolving door pattern of leaders. But I think one of the areas of continuity will be the extent to which the, Japan's current and future prime ministers will continue to prioritize this kind of detente, this kind of um, uh, thawing of relations with South Korea. I think it's, be it's becoming a very important priority in Tokyo. The same thing with pulling the, the Philippines into the mix. Um, I think President Marcos of the Philippines has really surprised me. I mean, I was one of those journalists a couple of years ago who was writing about, oh my god, uh, uh, Marcos coming back into power in the Philippines. He's been surprisingly pragmatic and stable. Um, um, he makes President Duterte um, look even nuttier than Duterte was when he was president. So I think in North Asia you will see a greater effort um, on the part of Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan as well to create something of a trade, something of a, a geopolitical block, if you will, a bulwark, bulwark uh, against what China is up to. I could be wrong about that, but we'll see. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, Professor Kim. So, uh, previous, uh, the previous ch Chairman Song asked about five years later, so let me bravely ask for a longer term question. You mentioned 1985 mm. when I entered college. <laughs> At that time, when you listed from Adam Smith to Karl Marx in the economics department, we read those, even in classes. So, I read some of all the writers that these days, they don't. And then, as a professor, we don't teach. Maybe it's our problem, but it's a problem of everybody, as you listed there. And when you said you took a walk last night, I don't know if you bump into any current or former IMF or World Bank officials, because... Just, just here. Okay. <laughs> the two-day conference yesterday and today and hosted by four in organization. And two of them are rare when they combine together. It's Bank of Korea and Ministry of Economy and Finance mm -hmm. with KDI and one Washington entity. They have a conference about reinventing Bretton Woods. And then it's the 80th anniversary of that. So if you push a little longer and relate to this election, what do you think? for Koreans, or for Japanese, or even for the world, when they think about current US politics, how it pans out. If you think about the last eight years, the biggest moment was the Nixon shock. What do you think would be the next big shock since World War II in terms of economics? And as we all prepare in Korea, for example, right. what are the things we have in mind, maybe in terms of the US election, or even for longer term as you experience. Because I spent 20 years in the United States, 10 years at the Federal Reserve on the island Greenspan hmm. as well, and then for Central Bank of Koreans in general, what's your, your comments for us? Wow, um, that's, uh, that's a very big, very big topic. Um, um, you know, when you look at the state of the, the world at the moment where things are headed, I, again, I 
think the biggest, the biggest earthquake, if you will, financially would be Trump 2.0 White House. I do. I think you would see the U.S. Um, I think Trump would at least try to pull out of NATO. Um, Trump hates the United Nations. Hates the United Nations. Um, be, it would be fascinating to see what he would do in a second term. Would he demand that the UN begin paying protection money, like you, some mafia boss, to stay in New York? Um, would he kick the UN out of New York, not realizing the own goal that that would be? Um, he has no use for the IMF or for the World Bank. Um, my brother works for one of the you know, the UN food agencies. Um, you know, what does the U.S. do with, with financing with regard to that? Um, I think I see that as the biggest earthquake going forward. And the kind of the, the relationships that Trump would build, I don't think it's a reach to think that if Trump gets into the White House again, that Kim Jong-un would be invited to the Oval Office. I think you'd see that within one year. I think you'd see a, a state dinner for Kim Jong-un. I think you'd see, you'd see, <laughs> wow, that, that would, I, I wouldn't mind seeing that. But I think Trump would try to bring Vladimir Putin uh, to the White House for a state dinner. Um, the different leaders that he would be in league with. So I, I really do think that the earthquake that I'm most concerned about is another Trump White House. And uh, I suddenly wish this was filled with uh, soju, but uh, I'll drink water for the moment. OK. All right. Uh, anything else? So you, you could raise a question in Korean, because we is uh, uh, simultaneously translated. So you're welcome to uh, raise that uh, sort of question. OK. Professor. Yeah, thank you for okay. the great opinion and comment about the future. Uh, my question is uh, something about your journalism. As a journalist, I mean, uh, Donald Trump has been on the stage for over the last eight years. So we can tell what's upside and downside of his candidacy. However, Kamala Harris is kind of, I mean, sudden star, right? So I cannot see that much downside of uh, her, 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 her candidate. Uh, what might be your in-depth opinion? I'm not asking your personal opinion. <laughs> You're leaning to democratic, right? right? Uh, I'm asking your in-depth journal uh, opinion as a journalist. Mm -hmm. What might be uh, her downside as a presidential candidate? Okay, yeah. that's a very fair question. Yeah. It's, a, it's a good question. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an old saying that um, policy, uh, that personnel is policy. And I think there's question, there's concerns about the different advisors that Kamala Harris would surround herself with. There was a lot of speculation early on when she became vice president about her management style. Um, there was a lot of volatility in the ranks, a lot of senior advisors coming and going, a lot of chatter about her being uh, not, not the best manager, if you will. So I think there are concerns about that. I think also, you know, there's a lot of unknowns about what she would want to do. When I talk about policy continuity, you know, I perhaps am thinking within the framework of what Trump would do and what she would do. But there are a lot of open questions about what kind of Federal Reserve chairman, for example, um, she would support, what kind of Treasury secretary she would bring on board. Uh, there's, she has talked about bringing a Republican uh, into her cabinet. Who might that be and in what role? And there's, there's a lot of unknowns about what Kamala Harris might do um, and the different pivots that she might make. And even though she's been a, a US senator and she's been vice president, and as you mentioned, she's having this moment where she is this interesting celebrity of sorts getting Time Magazine covers. Um, there are a lot of open questions about how she would, where she would lead the US when she is her own person. And I think that's something that the, that's one of the reasons why there's so much a focus at the moment about her doing interviews. Um, why isn't she doing more interviews with the media? I think in many ways she's probably not 
meeting with the media so much because we will be asking these questions. We'll be asking these questions about why she has changed so many of her uh, positions over the years. And that does make her something of a, of a wild card, right? In that it's very hard to look at her positions from five years ago and figure out how she made this progression to where she is now. And so I think there's a lot of questions, a lot of uncertainty about where she would bring the US. But you know, as, as, a, as, a, as an American voter, I see Kamala Harris as a survivable event for America. Trump, I don't know. <laughs> Okay, please, yes. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Walter van Houten with the European Union delegation. I just arrived in uh, Korea. Thank you very much for the invitation and very good uh, uh, event. Uh, no, I had two points, if you don't mind, William. Uh, one is the economists, and I think the colleague already uh, told you, I'm also one of these people who studied them, uh, and I, I just want to defend them a little bit, because <laughs> I don't think Marx or any of the others could foresee a COVID crisis True. beyond <laughs> their, their, uh, their deaths. Huh? Uh, at the same time, we might be missing people like that who have a vision or a view of what today's economy should be, uh, mm. how, how we should... Uh, uh, work on the policies. My question is, you gave the picture about Trump. Uh, in Europe, it's interesting, our presentations on economy would probably start with your last bullet, geopolitics. Mm. Uh, so uh, what you see in Europe is a little bit the geopolitics is now sort of the big thing and the economics comes a little bit after. And uh, we are really worried about security in Europe. We know that Trump will probably not be very beneficial to Europe, I think a bit like in, in South Korea. The people Where are you are from, I'm sorry? I'm from the Netherlands. Okay. Yeah. Um, but my question is, would Harris be able, uh, so two questions, one is, the US is no longer the US it once was as a protector of the world, so Harris can probably not change that, so that sort of uh, decreasing influence will continue, and how do you see <coughs> that with regard to Russia, uh, North Korea, you know, uh, events like that? Uh, and, and how would Harris be different from Biden in sort of attacking these crises, if any. Thanks. No, good question. I mean, as I said earlier, I, I do think the US is going through something of a midlife crisis. But I think that Harris would prioritize the European relationship with the US. It, she would prioritize relations not only government to government, but with Brussels. Um, NATO would be a priority for the US. And I, I think, you know, you mentioned Russia. Um, there's a reason why Vladimir Putin is waiting around praying that Trump comes back, and because Trump on day one would say to him, hey, Ukraine, take it, I don't care. And Harris would not be that person. And I think that when you look at the geopolitical um, hiccups we're seeing, I, hiccups is probably not a strong enough word, but you look at recent electoral events in Germany. Um, you look at how France always seems one election away from terrible headlines. Um, I'm still trying to get my head around Brexit in many ways, uh, even though we're almost 10 years on, at the, well, eight years on at this point. Um, I just think that Harris would understand, or does understand, the importance of the, you know, the cross-Atlantic relationship, and she'd prioritize it in ways that Trump would not. Trump, you know, of course, Trump sees NATO as a as a um, something of a um, what's the word um, parasite, if you will, and <laughs> I, I'm, I'm serious. He he sees he see, he sees NATO as a parasite, um, an organization that exists for itself, a wasteful organization. He sees the UN as a parasite. Harris, I think, has a very very different view of the world, and that alone, that mindset as small as it might seem, it, it matters a great deal in terms of the, the message that the U.S. sends the world in the months ahead. I just think out of 330 million people, if America re-elects Donald Trump after what we've seen, what we know about him, then we are stupid people. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, time is running out, so I, perhaps a few uh, uh, concluding remarks on my part. Uh, first, as you said before, uh, you know, we have no blueprint uh, for this uh, uh, discussion. 
uh, because so much uncertainty is involved here. And the potential outcome of this U.S. election two months away will be so profoundly different. Uh, so uh, it will be very, it, it will be very uh, uh, difficult and also hazardous to assume uh, one way or another uh, we have to be prepared for uh, either of those two possibilities. It's radically different company, uh, uh, you know, uh, complexion and, and implications for our future uh, position. Uh, and all in all, uh, Trump's weakness or hazard have been pretty widely known. Whereas Harris' strength has not been very uh, widely known. So in a way, I think it's, uh, Harris' uh, camp may pursue a campaign strategy uh, to make her uh, not very explicit on the uh, on the future uh, uh, policy direction, and perhaps that's maybe that may be part of it. Uh, but uh, uh, before we close, I would like to give you one one final question about uh, uh, Harris, uh, if she's elected, uh, position against China. Because uh, there are a lot of talks about uh, her uh, lack of experience or uh, different uh, uh, sort of uh, path she had as far as uh, China is concerned. Because as I understand it, she has never visited China. It's a very rare uh, case, whereas uh, her uh, running mate uh, has been there more than 30 times, uh, even taught at uh, high school. Uh, but later became very critical of uh, Xi Jinping uh, you know, administration for uh, violating human rights. So there are some mixed uh, signal comes out. So I'm, I'm wondering how she would deal with China and the issues involved in Northeast Asia, or the question raised earlier, because that will be profoundly important for countries like uh, Korea, Japan, Taiwan and surrounding this uh, this part. Thank you. Right. Um, what's interesting is the Republicans in the U.S. They've been trying to attack Tim Waltz based on his uh, experience with China. Um, there's actually been talk of investigations into the extent to which maybe Tim Waltz is a Chinese plant. However, that effort had a problem when there was a photograph of Tim Waltz and the Dalai Lama mm -hmm. together. So you're right, it's, it's an interesting topic. I mean, Kamala Harris is not a China expert, by no means. She's surrounded herself, however, with like, for instance, Kurt Campbell. Um, there's a lot of talk about him being a, a senior advisor in her administration. Um, he's an old Asia hand. Um, I think the Harris policy with regard to China would be less about China and more about how the U.S. is getting itself in shape to compete with China. Trump is all about tariffs. Trump, again, Trump thinks it's 1985. He thinks that the way to take on China is to tax its goods. That's a tax on U.S. consumers. That's going to backfire. That's going to lead to U.S. inflation. It's going to lead to retaliation. I think what you see from Harris, when I mentioned continuity, is I think that you'll see Harris focusing more on the ways in which America can get itself into better shape to increase productivity, to support innovation. You've seen her in the last 24 hours talk about tax incentives for startups, um, for, you know, for young entrepreneurs who are sitting in a garage someplace in the US with a laptop and a dream. Um, I like seeing those, those kinds of policies, those micro policies. And I think that Harris would be far more focused on getting the US in better shape at home, limbering up, building economic muscle, investing in chips, investing in green energy, uh, investing in different kinds of, of out-of-the-box education opportunities that the U.S. hasn't focused on, as opposed to top-down tariffs on China as if it's 1985. So I think her effort to take on China would be more about how the U.S. is ready to take on China on the playing field than trying to trip China on the course before the finish line. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
time to close. Thank you very much for your uh, participation and engagement in our conversation and also uh, listening to our uh, great speech from uh, Mr. Pesek. Let's uh, give a big hand to uh, our speaker.